So you know a little bit about me. Uh, I know a few things about you. I know, I know that uh, you're obviously committed people to show up on a Monday morning after graduation uh, for a thing on professional development like this, and that's exciting. It's always fun to work with people who have that kind of commitment. The other thing I know is you're quite open-minded to show up not only for a, a session on professional development, but for some uh, yahoo from west of the Mississippi clear out to Oklahoma to come out here and they'd listen to him tell you some things. So I, we got a good audience here. I'd like to, would like though, to find out one other piece of information. I know some of you are here as part of the uh, top 40, uh, what do you call it, top 40 academy? Yes. Yeah. How many people are part of that? Just show of hands here, so quite a few. How many people are other than that? Oh, so we've got a lot of better just uh, faculty here for the heck of it uh, on, on a Sunday morning or a Monday morning here. All right, well, what I'm, uh, this, this session, the first session this morning is not about course design. There's a piece of it that we'll talk about that, but the, uh, it, uh, after the, the workshop after this is about that. But what this morning's uh, session is about is a little bigger topic. Uh, it's about something that I think all faculty members need to engage in, and I'll share a little bit about that. Uh, with you, that is, we're professionals, which means if we're really a professional, in, in a sense, not just getting paid for it, but, but that other bigger sense, that means we really want to do a good job. And second, uh, all true professionals or good professionals work regularly at getting better at what they do. And that's the theme of this talk. And uh, where did I put my remote here? Oh, right here. Uh, here it is. Okay. And when we talk about getting better, uh, I want to lay out a little bit of, of what I mean by that. If this is a time chart here uh, with the quality of teaching on the, on the vertical here, and you notice I don't have any markers because it doesn't matter how good or how not good you are, wherever you are, you're right here now, okay? If you take that as the, the starting point, all of us, then my belief is the following, that, that everybody who teaches has the potential to get better. I don't care how good you are, how bad you are, you can get better. Real quick check on that. How many people in here have won a teaching award? Show hands, just real quick. Hold your hands up, keep your hands up just a second here. You've won a teaching award. Could you get better? Yes. Where's the other hand? Could you get better? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> okay. Over here I saw some hands. Could you get better? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Most people say that, okay. Uh, and, and that was true in the program that I ran at Oklahoma. A lot of our participants were people who had already won teaching awards, but that's why they got to where they were good enough to win a teaching award, because they have kept working at it over time and got better and better, okay? And if the best amongst us can get better, we can all get better, I would think, okay? Now, but that's the potential, okay? What's the reality? Well, I think there's a range of realities. One of them is there are people who do, in fact, get better every year, every year, okay? And I suspect a lot of you are in that category. I am in that category. Not bragging, but I can tell you for a fact, I know things about teaching now and can do things as a teacher now that I did not know, could not do, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. If you can say that, you are, by definition, on a growth curve, okay? So a lot of people are on that, but not everybody is. I've seen a lot of professors, and you've seen a lot of professors that look more like that, okay? Get better for a year, two or three, just from learning quickly from experience, but then they level off. And in fact, I drew this beeline a few, you know, several years ago when I was thinking these things out, but then I thought it, then I, I, I got feedback from it from a friend of mine in physics at Oklahoma I was showing this to, and his name was John, and I showed it to John, said, what do you think about that? He looked at it, he said, not so, Fink. What do you mean, not so? Says the horizontal part of that line, not true. I said, why is that? Physis, physicist reasoning. Because teaching is a dynamic activity. And in any dynamic system, there is no such thing as stasis. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. You never stay the same, just doesn't happen, okay? So I think what the real trajectory is, is like that, okay? Is B, okay? So we're gonna take, or C, we're gonna take B out of there. So you have, in fact, people who get better. You have people get better for a little while, but then level off, and then, and then in fact, drop off, okay? Now, if you're in this room, you're either an A person or an A wannabe, okay? Either way. 
What I'm going to talk to you today is, if you're an A wannabe, and what we really are, always, we just always want to get better, if you are an A wannabe, how do you do that? Okay. Well, two things I think, two principles we all have to follow if we want to get better. One is, we have to shift from being subject-centered, some people call it teaching-centered, to being learning-centered. And I'll unpack that in just a second. But the other thing is what we have to just work for continuous improvement. Every year, every year, no matter how good we are, how awful we are, how awful we feel we are, whichever, it doesn't matter, we have to work at getting better. If we can do those two things, we can <clears throat> get on a growth curve, okay? Now, good, let's see, let me, uh, let me back up here just a second. Uh, handout, did you all get the handout that we passed out here? Okay. Uh, I want to pause here for a second. Let's see, now one of these shuts that off, right? Yeah, right there. I want to pause for a second and ask you, everybody here, just to write out a, a couple sentences about each of the first, no, the, just the first uh, question there. What am I doing now to get better as a teacher? Okay, let me just get a sampling of what some of you put down. Is anybody willing to share what sort of things you're doing? Just give me a sampling of some of this. Anybody? Pam? Yeah. Well, I go to workshops. Go to workshops like, like this. Okay. I explore new techniques, understand these online, understand these online resources. I try to read literature about teaching once in a while, not on a regular wow. basis. Wow, well, you're, you're doing a bunch. Um, I have changed my teaching and problem session style according to the class setting that I have. Okay, great. Wow, that's good stuff. Yes? Um, having just done grading, reflecting on what I did the past semester, what I could, should, and would have done, like staging assignments, different ways, et cetera. Uh, yeah. Designing new courses for next year okay. and thinking about new assignments that might fit into those new courses. Okay, so looking at feedback, trying to reimagine how could we do even better and uh, trying to rethink things, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, other people want to share some things? One or two things? Yeah. Uh, I listen to my students. Okay. And, and so you, when you say listen to them, give me a little concreteness. I mean, is that one-on-one -on -one collectively or how? what they want to see in a course. Yeah. They like to see the course structures. Right. Respond to... And, and what they think would work to improve their success. Okay. <coughs> okay. So these are good things, and I am guessing here that a lot of you had things like this. Uh, good things. What I think also happens for a lot of people unless you make the special effort that sound like several of you here, maybe all of you in this room are, uh, what happens with a lot of professors is that that first year or two, uh, it's very easy to learn how to get better as we're first beginning teaching, you know, which for most of us was out of grad school. Uh, we saw a thing too here, oh gee, I, I can do better, I need to change that and we get better. So. But then we do kind of level off and we feel like we're on that, that B curve I showed a while ago, that, that plateau. Uh, but then I wrote an interesting article I'm going to refer to later, by, written by a, a doctor up in, in Boston about professional development. And he made the comment that that was what he was feeling about himself. He'd gotten better a lot during those first three years, and then he felt like kind of leveled off and reached a plateau. And then when he thought about it, that plateau he thought he was on, he says what really was happening was I had just stopped getting better. I had stopped getting better. And then, then he led to some other thinking, led him say, I gotta get off of that plateau. That plateau is not where I wanna be. And he did some things we'll, we'll talk about a little bit. And what this talk basically is, how do we get off that plateau? That is, uh, are there some ideas out there about teaching that are powerful enough to really take us from wherever we are to even higher levels? And I'm going to make, try to make the case I think there are lots of ideas, but I'm going to focus those down a little bit. Uh, I'm going to, it's, it's almost like we reached a hill, we've got a, a glass ceiling over us. And I'm going to try to offer you a view, say, I think here's how we can get through that glass ceiling and go up to an even higher, higher level. Now, um, see, yeah, I'm going to show you a picture of teaching and the place of getting better within it. And here's how it goes. I think there are some fundamental tasks about teaching. We're gonna look at these later in that workshop. That no matter, good teacher or bad teacher, it doesn't matter. If you teach, you have to do these things. You have to know something about the subject you're trying to teach. You have to design the learning experiences. Once a class starts, you interact with students in a variety of ways and you manage the course, okay? It's gotta do, we wanna do those well. We also hope, however, that those activities lead to a high impact on student learning. Things that happen during the class, they learn by the end of the class, after the class, that 
those activities that we do result in student activities that result in learning that, that has all kind of good things. But the other part, and this is the part of our, our job that I think is not fully recognized by the profession yet, is we got to get better over time. And what does that mean? For me, that means something like this, and it starts in the, the red box in the upper left-hand corner. We have to acquire some new ideas on teaching and learning. But acquiring them isn't enough. We've got to get those ideas and use them. And that means we've got to change something in these four yellow circles. If we don't change something, we're not changing our teaching. And we can't improve our teaching unless we change something in our teaching. But then after we try it, then we've got to assess it. Oh, okay, we try small groups, we try reflective writing, we try some of these other things. Did it help or didn't it? Did it make student engagement better or not? Did it make student learning better or not or whatever? Then after we've done some work with that a while, then we reflect what else we might learn, learn some new dyes, and start to circle all over again. So to, for me, the right professional activity for all teachers, all college teachers, is to continually cycle around those red boxes and get better and better and better. Now, let's pull those red boxes down. So what do we have to do? We have to learn about and use those new ideas, but also assess and get feedback so we know whether we're implementing them in the right way. And that's basically what this talk is about, but especially that number one here and a little bit on number two. Now, so that's the cycle. Get some ideas out there, learn about them, use them, assess them, share them with colleagues. That's where scholarship and teaching and learning reflect and go back around it. But it all starts with learning new ideas. I think it's going to be really hard to get better unless we learn new ideas. It may come from workshops, may come from talking to students, may come from own imagination. But the good news is there are the scholars of teaching and learning have been very active in the last 20 years on generating some new ideas that we can borrow. We don't have to create them de novo individually ourselves. We don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. When I, I've been in this business since the 1970s, and I can tell you there's been a sea change of difference starting about 1990. In the 70s and 80s, we had a few books on college teaching that were good, but not more than a handful. We had McKeechee's Teaching Tips and a few others, okay? And we all kind of knew what those were. But starting about 1990, books started coming out with powerful ideas on college teaching. The big one that I remember was Active Learning that suddenly announced it's improving teaching mean, can mean something more than just refining the way we lecture, getting more organized, more enthusiastic, uh, talking to students or something like that. There's a whole different concept that we could take this thing called Active Learning. Well, I've been keeping track of those ideas. And if you look at... Uh, page four on this handout. I have a, a, an annotated bibliography of, this is not the canon on college teaching, these are just books that rang my bell from which I learned something major that really had a big impact on my teaching. It's a long list of probably 50, 60, 70 books, which means 50, 60, 70 ideas, but then I, I did one refinement on that chronological list and put them into what you're looking here on page four and five here, a thematic list and kind of put them into basic categories of ideas about teaching. And each one of those blue lines is, a, is a, an idea from a, uh, from a book. And on this annotated bibliography, which I put on a website that you can see after this, uh, after today, at the bottom of page three, there's a, down at the bottom, there's a URL that I've started putting a whole bunch of materials that I'm going to refer to today. But one of it is that annotated bibliography. It's on that website, and you can go to it. And if you click on any of these blue things on there, it'll just take you right to the annotated bibliography. But as you can see here, there's a lot of ideas out there, OK? Can be a little bit overwhelming. So one of the things that I've done is try to refine that one more time and pull that down. And let's see, we got this on here. Uh, go down here. F I'm going to call them Fink's Five Transformative Practices. I'm going to buy into alliteration here, okay? The ideas that I, five ideas that I think if you could learn about them enough to use them and use them effectively, they will truly transform your teaching, which means they're going to transform student learning. So I'm going to lay these out for you in this morning session here, share some ideas with them, and then I've got some other ideas on the feedback here. But real quickly, what they are is this. First thing is some ways of changing students' views of learning. 
This is going to get a little bit to what the provost was talking about here. Students come in from high school, have a set of ideas, not always helpful to getting high quality learning going. We've got to make some changes now. I'm going to share some ideas that I've just learned about just within the last year. Uh, uh, two people that I've got these ideas from. That's one set, I think really powerful. Second is my ideas on course design. That's where the workshop is this afternoon is going to be on. The third one is this team-based learning. Not an idea I generated, but a colleague of mine in Oklahoma, and I helped him uh, put those ideas together, along with this lady in the brown uh, blouse over here who helped edit that book, Arletta Knight, uh, also now known as Arletta Knight Fink. I thought she was such a good worker. I said, I want it even closer to home here. I want her into the, into the household here. I don't want to let that kind of talent go, go somewhere else, okay? And then fourth, a little bit about how to be a leader with your students. That's part of that interacting with them. And then finally, to get students reflecting about their own learning so they can start to feel like they, they own it, they're in charge of it, they know how to uh, handle it and promote it, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the five transformative teaching practices I want to unpack a little bit. Let's start with this first one, students' view of learning, okay? Now, most of us look at our students and say, my job as teacher of, my case background, geography, your case history, economics, whatever, is to sort of share a lot of my knowledge of the subject matter with them, gear them up on the subject matter. True, okay, but not sufficient. What we have to do, especially when we've got lower division classes, especially freshmen, even sophomore, maybe later, but especially with those courses, it could really make a difference if we could sit down with those students and somehow reorient them uh, in terms of their views of learning and of themselves as learners. Because they have some ideas about learning that are not productive, just like as a lot of college teachers have ideas about teaching that are not productive, okay? We gotta work on that. Now the two ideas that I've come across that I think really have a lot of power, one is a lady named Sandra McGuire from LSU. She worked in the student success office but also was a professor of chemistry and what I'm talking about is what she did with students in her chemistry courses, big, large classes. The other is a, a professor of English, Stephen Carroll, out at Santa Clara University in, in California. Well, what Sandra McGuire did was focus in on the concept of metacognition, okay? Which, when we unpack it, is metacognition, thinking about thinking. And what she wants to do is get students to where they can think about thinking. They don't know how to do this. I mean, a few do, but the vast majority of freshmen don't know how to do this. They don't know what that term means and all the things associated with it. So, I'm gonna do with you what she does with her students just to give you a sense of what this is. Now, you all know your, you still remember what the vowels are, right? English language here, okay. So I'm gonna give you a list here. And I'm gonna give you 50, 45 seconds I want you to count the number of vowels in it. There's your list. Okay. Now I want to ask you a question. How many items in that list can you remember? <laughs> okay. I want you to, that's a serious question. I want you to write, think about how many of those items you can remember. How can many people remember 10 or more? How many people can remember five or more? One, okay. Everybody else is in the one to four range, I assume, okay? Now, you're PhDs, most of you, right? Pretty smart people. But you, you, you blew that test here, okay? How come? Okay, let's well, see, we got that here. That's what happened. Sandra did this at a big, uh, big meeting with, I don't know, it must have been a thousand people in the room, and that was roughly the percentage of our answers, about like yours there, okay? Uh, take a look at that list. Do you notice anything interesting about that list? Yeah. Words are a lot longer on the right. Yeah, that's not the key thing, though. Numerical. Say more. Who, who said that? Numerical is fine. Say how? One, two. Dollar bill is one, dice is two, tricycle is three. Uh-huh. Got it? See it? All the way up to what? Uh, uh, Fifteen here. Okay. Now that you see that, let's try that again. Let's see how, I'm gonna give you 45 seconds. See how many of those items on that list you can remember. Okay, see if you can just mentally or write down whichever. See how many of those you can remember. Oh, I better take them off, I gotta take them off the list here. Yeah. 
Now, see how many you can jot down from memory. In order. Okay, I, you're pretty well close to finish. How many people this time could remember 10 or more? Wow, okay. Uh, so, uh, okay, I don't remember a whole bunch more, and that's what happened to us. Now, what just happened in these last five minutes here? Did you all, through the magic aura of my presence, get your IQ went up? <laughs> I don't think so. Something else happened. What happened? Two things. This is Sandra Mag Sandra's point here. One, we understood what the real task was. Okay, now I fooled you, but I'm going to make a point about that. But the other thing is, we figured out what the structure of that information was, how it was organized. Okay. Now, Sandra's point about freshman students is they're misled or they're misunderstanding higher education on both of those points. Okay. One, they don't know what the real task is. And that's what the provost was talking about. A lot of students, not all of them, but a lot of students coming in thinking the task of learning in college is the same as it was in high school. Remember all that blooming information from the time it was presented till the time of the test. Rather than problem solving, critical thinking, analysis, et cetera, compare and contrast or whatever, okay? They got the wrong task they're working on. The second is they don't, it's just a pile of information. They don't understand that it has an organization and that their real job is to figure out how it's organized and then figure out how to use that organization to, to do the task, whatever it is, okay? Her thesis, therefore, was if we can help them understand what the real task is and understand, help them understand how this information, chemistry, geography, or whatever is organized, their quote unquote intelligence is gonna go way up. Uh, either their performances go way up. And this is one of the things she, so what she does, I ask her, I said, so what do you do? Do you send your students over to the student success and have them take a five-week uh, seminar on metacognition? She said, yeah, I send them, but nobody goes, okay? <laughs> and you can't get them to go over there. So here she is, a, a freshman uh, chemistry teacher, you know, make a class, says, I take, I wait until after, let's see if I got this here, yeah. I, I wait, no, let me back up here. I wait until after they've had one or two tests, and a lot of them got feedback that says, I'm not succeeding in this stuff. I'm getting 40s, 50s, 60s, or whatever. And they got a little bit of anxiety about them. And she says, I'm going to offer, I'm a chemistry teacher, I'm going to offer one extra 50 minute, or well, one hour session, out of class, out of regular times, Tuesday evening or whatever, on how to learn chemistry. And what she does in that 50 minutes is she spends about the first 15 minutes or whatever, kind of like we just did here, talking to them about their own intelligence. Because one of their misconceptions is they're coming in with the view that their intelligence is fixed. They're either smart or they're dumb. What she spends some time convincing, this comes out of a mindset book by Carol Dweck, I think it is. Intelligence is fluid. You can increase your intelligence if you understand intelligence and, and work at it right. That's part of it. And she does you know, this little the vowel thing that we just did to help convince them of that. And then second, I'm going to teach you some study skills. And then the study skills are stuff we've known for years. You know, read beforehand, take the next le lecture notes, review them afterwards, talk to somebody about it, et cetera, et cetera. You know, all the safe we've known, but students haven't known what to do with it. So she works on it for, for an hour. And here's what happens. Does she get results? I'm just, she had lots of data, but I want to show you three of them that's kind of dramatic. Travis was a junior. On the first two tests, got a 47.52. On the next two tests, after attending that session, got 82 and 86. Got to be in the course. Uh, Joshua had 60s and 50s, got 80s and 90s after that. Uh, Diana was a first year physics student, had 80s, 54, and then had A's, all you know, the rest of the tests thereafter. Dramatic difference in student performance in the second half slash two thirds of the course, not because their IQ really went up, but because she, she helped them understand what the real task was and how this information organized how to study for it. And they, the undercover was they were more intelligent. So she taught them about metacognition, about the nature of learning, et cetera. Powerful introduction for freshman students. Now, Stephen Carroll out of Santa Clara does something a little different. He, works, he goes around to it the first day of class. He doesn't, it's not test-based kind of thing. 
What he is focused, not metacognition, but helping students get ready for self-directed learning. Take charge of your own learning. Now, I've been working on both these people to get together some videotapes to show us what they're doing, because I find out if people see it, they can emulate it in your own classes. For Stephen, we didn't get a video, but we got an animated video with some pictures of him talking. Hi, this is Stephen Carroll. And Andrea Pappas from Santa Clara University. Our way of doing introductions in the first day of class increases our students' motivation and engagement and helps make them more self-motivated in their approach to learning. The key is to help students think carefully about their goals and then to help them see how their existing beliefs and habits around learning get in the way of their ability to achieve those goals. In our classes, it sounds like this. Hi, I'm Professor Pappas, and I'm a professor that you will remember. Whoa. This is important. To start this class, each of you is going to introduce yourself. You will have a lot of freedom to define yourself in college, so this will be your first piece of critical thinking. Who are you going to be in this class? Your introduction should be memorable and should help us get to know you. Your introduction can be up to 90 seconds long and should be based on the following questions. Who are you? Why are you here? Where are you going? And what do you want? You have five minutes to prepare your introduction, and remember, it should be memorable. Five minutes later, Professor Pappas introduces herself using the four questions. Then the students introduce themselves. We make it a point to visibly take notes as they do. Typically, students' introductions are remarkably unmemorable. When they're done, we give them a five-minute break. Now let's reflect. I'd like to push you a little on why you are here. Who will volunteer to say more about your answer? I'm here so I can get a good job. Really? How does being here get you a good job? Well, it's not just being here. It's the degree that's going to land me that sweet job. How does that work? If I were to give you your diploma right now, how would that help you get this great job? Well, my resume will show that I'm a college graduate. That puts me ahead of people who haven't gone to college. Perhaps, but you are a first-year student. You haven't really gone to college yet. How will your diploma alone make you a better person to hire than someone else? Perhaps someone who has more experience because they didn't go to college. Okay, so maybe it's not just having a degree. But by the time I graduate, I will be more qualified. Good. So what will make you more qualified? Is it just being here and hanging out that will make you a great employee? Well, no. But I'll learn stuff along the way. Sounds good. What will you learn? I'll learn skills. You know, like in my major. Okay. But the guy who worked for four years instead of going to college probably has some pretty good skills, too. Yeah, but I will have learned other stuff, too, like principles and theories. He's only going to know about the specific projects he worked on. I'll know a lot more. I, I will have learned other things in other classes, too, uh, things that will help me do a better job, like how to do research. Uh, plus, uh, I'll be able to write well and to think critically. Aha! That sounds like a pretty good reason to be here. You're here to learn a discipline? but also to learn how to read and write and think critically. Those are the things that are going to help you get and keep that sweet job. So you need to spend the next four years focused on learning about your discipline and on learning to read, write, and think critically. How does this sound? Are those goals you're willing to work toward? Well, you make it sound like a lot of work. But yeah, I guess that's kind of why I came to college. We repeat the process with three or four other students until they see the pattern. We don't stop asking questions until the student explains what they need to learn or how they're going to be changed by school. The night's homework assignment is to write up a revised self-introduction based on the four questions. The point of all this is to prompt students to explore more consciously why they're in college and to get them to commit publicly to their own goals for learning. We come back to each student's goals repeatedly throughout the course, especially when their behavior seems to contradict their stated goals. We ask them how what they're currently doing is supposed to support those goals, and then give them a chance to revise, either the goals or the behavior. This helps students see how their existing beliefs and habits often block them from reaching their educational objectives. It also helps motivate them to explore other forms of learning, and helps make them more self-directed learners. Following this first reflection, we guide them through a second debrief this time looking at how their unmemorable introductions did not follow instructions and how that undermined their ability to reach their goals. 
Now, uh, in there, in this website, which the URL for is on this uh, that website I'm telling you about, there's two videos. You saw the first one. I'm not going to take time for the second one now. But the second one, he talks, they talk about the activities and press the students. So what are you doing to learn all this good stuff? But now what you see him doing here in this animation is getting students to do things. But then notice those questions, how they press the students to go deeper and deeper. So you're going to get a job. Yeah, well, how? What are you going to learn? Is that really going to do that? Is that really going to outcompete somebody with four years of experience? So press them, press them, press them on that. And the same thing with their, with their, their activities. What he's trying to get the students to realize is get the students to be self more deeply self-aware, both of the connection between learning goals, learning activities, not just formal learning goals in a course, but their own personal life learning goals, learning activities, and how their current activities are not in line with where they say they want to go. And if you really want to get a good job, which means if you really want to learn, you're going to have to change your learning habits. And so they work on that. Uh, now, what's, what's really interesting for him, he shared a couple of things. He had a two-page of single-spaced desk. I said, does this make a difference? And he shared a bunch of stuff with me. I'm going to just share a couple of highlights. One of which is at Santa Clara, they have a, the dean's list. It's not grade point related. It's percentage. The top 10% doesn't matter what everybody's grade point is. The top 10% make the dean's list. So do you assume at any given freshman class, roughly you would expect 10% might show up on the dean's list downstream? In his class, 40% of his, when they, his students, when they were juniors, 40% were on the dean's list. 45% made it as seniors, which meant they kept getting better and better at becoming self-directed learners, effective self-directed learners. One of the other things he shared was uh, the, his students who get elected to honor societies about three times the rate of the general population. Uh, campus leaders are just all over the place in leadership position. But his comment was this. The quality of the student work is better in every way after he finally spent this time. And he spent a couple sessions, beginning of the class, beginning of the course, uh, working on this. So what are you doing here? The four questions he calls them and get them to think, think through the relationship between their activities, their goals, and what they're doing in college, et cetera. So I think one of the really powerful ideas is if we can take time in our classes, in our own subject matter oriented courses, and spend some time doing something, whether it's Sandra McGuire's or Stephen Carroll's, our own thing, but help change students' view of what learning is, the real nature of learning, and of themselves as learners. It can have a profound effect on their behavior and, and their learning, okay? Now, second thing is learning-centered course design, okay? And this is the, the central idea in that book that I put out in 2003. And this will be, I'll just give you a quick overview of it because we're going to have the whole workshop on it. But uh, basically there were two central ideas in, in that book. One is that we can expand our sense of what we want students to learn, that what they might learn. Now how many of you in here are familiar with the Bloom Taxonomy? Is that something, quite a few of you, okay. Bloom Taxonomy, created a half a century ago, almost 60 years now, uh, powerful, where, where he was trying to get professors to realize that you can do more than just memorize and, and you know, have students understand ideas. You can get into analysis, synthesis, et, et cetera, and evaluation. What I did after talking to a lot of students was expanded that even and included the, what he had is kind of on the right-hand side of this diagram, but the, the left-hand side where students, and let's see if I got the, no, let's back up here, uh, learning about themselves, how to interact with others, how to care about things, and learn how to keep on learning. So those are possible goals we can have for our classes, and if we do, a course with that kind of goals might look like we want students to understand and remember some things, yeah, the key stuff, uh, know how to use that content, how to relate one sub that subject to other subjects, understand the personal social implications of it, value it, which means value learning more about it, and then know how to keep on learning more about it. Can we do that, all of that, in a single course? Yes, we can. People have done it, okay? Now, how do you get all that to happen? So one part of that is just expanding our sense of what kind of learning might, we might go after. And the other then is how do we build that kind of learning in the course, and that's the course design part. And basically I was saying you gather information about the situation, then use that to identify your in the, to learning goals. Once you get those real clear, then you identify your learning activities and assessment <laughs> in a way that supports those learning goals. And that's what these arrows are, and that's what makes it integrated. Now, you, then you expand that a little bit with 
How do you do each of those right? Uh, you do an in-depth analysis, make sure you have significant learning goals, more than just clear. And you plug in active learning into learning activities and a thing called educative assessment and the assessment, then you make sure it's all integrated. And that's what we're going to do in the workshop is learn how to unpack those, those five central steps here. Now, how's that process work? And this is what's kind of fun. You have to imagine. I mean, course design, design is imagination and, and creativity. You have to imagine some exciting new goals, and that's where that taxonomy can help you. And so you make a list of whatever, whether it's mine or Bloom's or your own or whatever. You make a list, and then you put it in a thing called a three-column table, which is like those three circles put into columns. You lay your learning goals out here, and then second step, or third step, you take each one of those, and for each one separately, you say, what are the assessment activities I need for that learning goal and the learning activities? and the same for each of the other learning goals. And what you figure out real quickly is, I need different assessment activities for different kind of learning. I need different learning activities for different kind of learning, okay? So I need the right kinds of activities for each of the separate kind of learnings to make sure I get those in there. Then I take all of these activities, which is what happens in the course, and I put them in a, our weekly schedule. All of these have to be in there somewhere, or else you don't have the activities necessary to drive the learning you said you want, okay? So they've got to be in there, but it makes a difference how you put them in there, and that's part of what we talked about. But if you put them in there in the right way, then you're going to get learning achieved matching the learning you imagined to begin with. And that's what's exciting, and that's what people find uh, transformative, if you will, about learning-centered course design or integrated course design. Uh, and people have, again, we'll share some of those uh, stories with you there, but people have said, it has returned the joy of teaching to me because my teaching can become much more intentional, as well as much more ambitious. I can go after bigger kinds of learning because I can see what I have to do to get there. Okay? So that's the idea of learning-centered course design. Now, third one was this idea of team-based learning, uh, which a guy named, lame, well, yeah, I think I got a picture, Larry Michelson, uh, who turned out to be a business professor there at Oklahoma, and I, I started the program, the course, the, uh, faculty development program at, at Oklahoma in 79. I found about him in 1980 when I was doing a newsletter. And somebody said, hey, this business professor over here is doing something interesting. So I went over and checked it out. I said, whoa, that is really different. And the more I looked at it, the more I said, I think that's pretty interesting. Well, after a while, uh, he started doing a lot of workshops on it. And, and people were writing and said, well, Larry, how do you do this? And how do you do that? And he was saying, well, look at this article and look at this article I put out. And I said, Larry, you can't do that. You got to pull all those ideas in one book, you know, one go-to source. Well, so he did. And this was you know, him and Arletta over here and myself. We helped him edit. It was his ideas. We just helped him get it down and held his arms behind his back until he wrote it down all in good shape. And in fact, I held his arms, and Arletta was the one that rewrote all the drafts that came in. And she was, if you read the book, you're reading what Arletta wrote. She's the one, the only one who could sit down and rewrite all those drafts. But had some good things. But here's the basic idea. Uh, let me back, let me pause that a second. And the, 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 the behind the team based learning idea is this. Have you ever heard that phrase, my job as an individual or as an institution is to transmit knowledge? You ever heard that? Forget it. Nobody thinks of you. Nobody has ever, ever transmitted knowledge. Never have, never will. Can't do it. It just doesn't work that way. What you can do is transmit information which is what I'm doing right now. I'm not transmitting all, I'm transmitting information. What you're doing is what everybody does. You're taking this information and say, I can make sense out of that, or I can't, I believe it, or I don't believe it, or I can see how to use it, or I don't see how to use it, or whatever. You, and that's called constructivism, okay? You construct your own understanding and whatever meaning it has for you. Two ways to do that. What you're doing right now is doing it by yourself, and we all do that, okay, and that happens. But sometimes we have the opportunity to do it in dialogue with others. We all heard this talk. What do you think he said? Was that meaningful? Do you believe it? Can you use it? How can we use it? Okay? You dialogue about it. And that's called social constructivism. And a lot of people like that because the chances of somebody having a correct and full and meaningful understanding of that information goes way up when you can dialogue about it. Okay? That's what's leading a lot of people to use small group activities, a lot of teachers to use it. Now, however, there are different ways to do that. Now, here's, I'm just a chart. Uh, here's traditional teaching without any of this social dialogue bit. It's just individuals sitting there reading the book, listening to the lecture, doing whatever, okay? But you've got different ways of using small groups, one of which is what I call casual. Turn to your neighbor and talk about this, okay? 
think pair share if you've ever heard somebody do that that's that's what that is think about it and, and just uh, you, do, you don't have to plan it ahead of time you can do it on the fly quick and easy okay but modest better than traditional stuff but modest in impact the other way you can do it is what cooperative learning does and, and there's some books out on that say I'm going to prepare a case study or a special problem and really have make sure I've got information in there a really good problem for them to work on and give it to them and a bigger bang okay true takes more work ahead of time takes some planning but you kind of stick it in the course and, and use it and you get a bigger bang. The third way of use it is not just to stick it into the course with the same structure, it's to restructure the whole course. I mean just restructure from the beginning to focus on how am I going to create high powered dialogue about important problems in this subject matter. And that's what team based learning does, somewhat like problem based learning. Okay? Uh, use it in a very focused way but with a totally restructured course. Now when I say restructured course, here's what I'm talking about. This is like a two-week timeline, okay? And here's what happens in team-based learning. The first thing that happens, happens out of course. You give students all the reading. The reading is front-loaded for the whole semester, for that whole unit, okay, for that two-week unit. Then, without any lecturing whatsoever, you give them a test on the reading, but in a kind of interesting way. You do it individually, take this test individually, multiple choice test, and then they take the same test immediately in class as a group. Predetermined groups. You have them set up in groups. Both scores count as part of the fourth grade. So they got to take both tests seriously. And then you can appeal and some follow up instruction. Whatever they don't understand after that, then the teacher can talk about that. But doesn't talk, have to talk about the whole topic because 80% of it they understood. He just has to talk about the, the, the 10, 15% or whatever that they still don't understand at this point. Then you spend a lot of time on in-class problem solving, practicing using it over and over and over with feedback in class, in groups. Maybe do some homework, maybe do whatever along here, and you just keep start with simple problems, gradually get more complex until finally you say, okay, I think you've got the hang of this, review it, and I'm either going to give you a, a, a group project or an individual exam or even a group exam on how to apply it as well as do you understand it. And what you see is the, the, the understanding of the content starts out fairly low after they've read it and nothing else, but just as to the test and the practice and the practice and practice, it gets up into the 80, 90, 100% range. So you don't worry about the partial understanding here. What you worry about is did we end up where I wanted it? And then you move on to the next unit and begin that same sequence all over. That's what I mean by restructuring the whole course around lots of intensive small group dialogue. Now, when you do that, here's kind of this, the, the key elements of it. Larry's kind of figured this out over time. You have to form the teams in the right way. Strategically formed means you distribute assets. Uh, and, they, and once you form the team, you leave them alone. You, you just let them stay put. Uh, that readiness assurance process after the reading, individual tests, group tests, and so forth. And then the key part is, is number three. You've got to make sure, as a teacher, that you put together good problems for groups. And a lot of students don't like group work because the teachers don't understand how to give them good group assignments for groups. They give them assignments that are good for individuals, but that are bad for groups. For example, got a group of six people here. You all put together a 25-page term paper. Okay? What's going to happen? Divide and conquer. You do part one, part two, part three, part four, so forth. Excuse me. She's kind of a blow it off kind of person and she, she doesn't do her part. But Marcus here is compulsive obsessive. I gotta have an A in this class. And I can't get an A if she, her part isn't done right. So get, what's Marcus do? His part and hers part. And he hates it because he had to do twice the work and they both get the same grade. Can't, you know, bad, the root cause is it's a bad assignment for a group. So you gotta give them where they make a good decision and things like that. And then fourth is for that very reason, most of the time these groups will work out pretty well. But nonetheless, you've got to give them an opportunity to the end of the course to do a peer evaluation. How well did everybody in the group contribute to the work of the group? And then it has to feed into the course grade somehow mathematically. You do that, and then they feel either you know, the hard workers will get a bonus and the, the loafers will, will not get full credit, and then people feel that's fair. You do those four things, and the TBL will really hum. Okay, yes? Yeah, yeah. When you form those groups, I said strategically form, uh, couple, two elements on that. One is 
you can't take the information about the students and go to your office and, and fill out the, the you've got to do it in class so they really know how the grooms are formed. Second, you, you include factors that you think are assets and distribute them across groups, but the one asset you cannot use is GPA. Why? Because if we did GPA, that's one of the factors. Give me your name again. Susan. Susan, okay. Susan's a four, I'm gonna give you a bunch. Yeah, she's a 4.0, okay? And she knows that she's in the group because she's a 4.0 and, you know, and a couple others might put the 4.0s in every group, you know, or one in each group. And she's a 4.0. So what's her attitude? Hey, y'all listen up. I'm the smart one in here. Listen up, okay? You don't want that. Well, Martin said, I'm going to put you on the other side. Now, Mark is sitting here with a you know, 2.0. And he's, what's he saying? I'm not going to open my mouth. I'm clear the dumb one in here. And I don't want anybody to see it. I want to show off my dumbness. So he's going to shut up. That does not good for group work. Even if she has the 4.0, that's not why she's in here. She's in my geography class, and she's in this group because she traveled a whole bunch. And he's in this group because he had one other geography course before, or something like that, okay? It's subject matter relevant factors, but not GPA, because that creates bad, bad things. Is that the key? Good, okay. Now, I want to show you a, a short video on this one. This scene might look like pre-class socializing for these first-year Duke medical students, but in fact, they are deep into the core of their lesson, employing a new model for medical learning at Duke. Team-based learning has been a staple at business schools for decades and is gaining traction at medical schools as healthcare delivery moves towards team-based approaches to caring for patients. The Duke University School of Medicine is embracing the educational model and is gradually incorporating it into the medical education curriculum. It's a, a richer interaction between the faculty member and the student. It's not just the faculty member giving a bunch of information. The future of healthcare delivery is going to be much more focused on team-based delivery of care. TDL kind of prepares us for um, you know, the field of medicine, which is increasingly collaborative and which has a wealth of information that no one person can know. Team-based learning includes four key components, individual study, individual readiness quiz, team quiz, and a team-based patient problem-solving application. The idea is to develop a case that will require the students to apply the concepts that they learned individually and just proved through the quiz process that they get to problem-solving situations. Are, do you think those little bumps are P-waves? I think they may be T-waves. Yeah, I think they're T-waves. I think they're T-waves. Yeah. Like, so like, I like the fact that it gets me <laughs> in the classroom with, with my peers and talking about things. It's, it's, nice to, it's nice to have a goal in mind and to kind of feel like you are part of the team. During the patient application, which is open book and open internet, each team comes to consensus on an answer and holds up a letter representing their choice. But the payoff is when the student from each team holds up what they believe is the correct answer, the faculty member can then engage the students in conversations with each other. See fair number of G's. Anybody want to attend respiratory illness? Team-based learning exercise after the quizzes is what's like the best part of TVL because it gives us an opportunity to kind of apply our skills in a group setting, which is what we're going to be doing once we're practicing. The majority of medical schools have not yet introduced team-based learning into their curriculums. The Duke University School of Medicine is ahead of those that do because of what it's learned from its sister school in Singapore, which has employed team-based learning since opening in 2007. I suppose that might work really well at Duke Medical School. You know, they got the cream of the crop in terms of students. We may not have that same caliber. But it doesn't just work at Duke Medical School. Uh, one of the, in that original book, uh, one of the really interesting chapters was written by a lady down at U University of Texas, San Antonio, about a course, I think, was it in psychology or something like that, or what was it? Yeah, yeah. I, I, okay, uh, whatever the subject matter was, it was one of these large classes, and half the students were Hispanic. I mean, well, I don't know half, but a large percentage were Hispanic at, at San Antonio. And the teacher was really worried. This whole thing starts with students doing a bunch of reading at the front end. Hispanic students, don't, one, don't know how to read, two, aren't used to reading. I don't know if it'll work. She said, but I'm going to try it because I think it has promise. She did it, and it worked so much better than anything she'd ever done before. And ha Hispanic students did really much better. Interesting, one of the side 
observation she made that's not the normal process, but it happened in this case. What she noticed was every day when they had one of those tests at the beginning after doing a reading, students were coming in 10, 15 minutes before class and sitting down in groups. And the Anglos and Hispanics were working together trying to double check each other's understanding of the material that they had just read. So they were collaborating on the understanding, okay? The other part of that was, think about Hispanic students, or somebody, anybody, any group that has reading problems. If you have to catch the information from a lecture versus getting it from the reading, which is better? Reading. Why? Be well, pacing, and if I get done and I don't understand it, what I can do, I can go back and reread it. I can't tell, hey, prof, can you repeat the last 15 minutes? I, I didn't quite understand that. Can't do that, okay? But reading, you can. So she found that with the reading, the reading challenge students did even better despite that for that reason, okay? Okay. Oh, here was one uh, student after a, uh, this, they, they have a, on, the, on a website, and this is listed on that resources, um, uh, that page with the resources, the URL for team-based learning. But they have a very active listserv on there. And I just happened to catch a uh, comment just last week by a teacher of nursing over at Virginia Commonwealth. And this was what one of their students said to the teacher at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the course. And this was what the teacher said about that. And there's that joy of teaching again. When you start to see the light bulbs going on, students getting energized, students working, students learning and excited about what they're learning, guess what that does for you? Just what you'd predict it would be. And it happens with team-based learning a lot. Okay, so team-based learning, a lot of power there. Yep. Uh, yeah, we gotta, we're gonna move through quickly through the last few items here, because we uh, said 55 minutes and we're gonna try to stick with that. We got started, what, about quarter tail, so we'll uh, wrap up here real quick. Another thing is, I think you want to try to be a leader with your students, and that's a nice phrase, but uh, one resource I'm pulling together for you, he didn't title it that, but some of you may know Ken Bain in this really well-known uh, book he put together, What the Best College Teachers Do. But what I did was go through and did a reanalysis of what he wrote in there, and that's on, your, my reanalysis is on the back page of your handout here. Uh, what did they do, what do they do differently? And you remember those four yellow circles that I showed earlier when I talk about interacting with students? Well, that's the right-hand column here. But if you look also at the attitudes, some of the course design decisions are going to be what we're talking about in the workshop. But all those things in that right-hand column, I think, are, are just things that if you read books on leadership, that's what they're talking about. So if you can, there's some things you can pick up, I think, from Ken Bain that will help you be good leadership. Uh, you yeah, know, there's that interacting with students. But leadership, for me, is the top, that's my definition of it. That's just my motivating and enabling. You gotta get them pumped up, but you also gotta figure out how to help them. Do something important, in our case that's learning, but do it well. And uh, what do you have to do to lead? And my answer to that is you gotta create the right kind of relationship. And I think these teachers in Ken Bain's book give us a lot of clues as to how to create that right kind of relationship. Okay, so be a leader. And then the last one is getting students to reflect on their own learning. It's interesting picking up what some of the uh, Sandra McGuire and Stephen Carroll talked about doing the first day, first few weeks of classes, to doing some things at the end of the classes to get students to reflect on the learning. And there's a guy, the, one of the a powerful way to do that is to use a thing called learning portfolios, which basically at the end of the semester, you have students step back from the learning and put, get, put together a 10, 15 page essay, narrative essay, reflective essay, about certain questions. And, and this John Zubizueta, who uh, teaches down at Columbia College in South Carolina here, uh, put this book together a few years ago. And here's my, here's my uh, little, my best uh, effort to do PowerPoint to show reflective uh, thinking here. This is student at time one, student at time two, okay? And we're a teacher out here interacting with students in various ways, as a teacher, coach, whatever you want to characterize it. That happens, that's gotta go on. But what I think we really wanna have happen is to get the students to pull back from their learning, look at it, and reflect on it and start asking some questions here. What did I learn in this class? What helped me learn it? What didn't help me learn it? What sense do I make of it? What value do I put on it, okay? And that's meta-learning, and once students learn how to be a meta-learner again by reflecting on their own learning, then they, light bulbs go off and they, good things happen. They, then they can change, they can reflect on and hold their own beliefs, their own knowledge out here and say, how can I make it better? What do I want it to be? My thinking, my performance, et cetera. And that's a meta learner. And then they can take charge of the hammer and, and shape it the way we want. And that's a lot of what Stephen Carroll got going 
And I think a, a learning portfolio activity at the end can help that process even further. Students start doing that in lots of courses in college, they're gonna be aware of themselves as learners. And more, and, and my argument is, if we want students to be self-directed learners, they can't do that very well unless they're aware of themselves as learners, and most students are not. We need to help them become aware of themselves as learners, both by reflecting through the course, but also at the end. Okay, uh, these are kind of questions. Uh, there's a sheet on, the, on that uh, webpage that resources uh, that I ask them in when I do learning portfolios. Okay. Now, five transformative pe teaching practices here. Okay, what are we, if you can do these, what are they? One, Stephen Carroll, Sandra McGuire, build a more dynamic view of learning themselves as learners. Integrated course design, get all of our course activities focused on really powerful slash significant learning goals. Team-based learning, create that dialogue amongst people. Uh, leadership, build the right kind of respecting, trusting community between, among students, between them and the you as a teacher. And then the learning portfolios, get students to reflect on and so forth, so forth. Now, as you try to implement, if you try to act on some of these and use them, one of the things you're gonna to have to do is get feedback. I'm just gonna briefly mention this, then we'll wrap it up. That article I mentioned when I started uh, this, Atul Gawande, and the whole article is on that website. The guy that said, uh, I think I just stopped learning how to get better. What prompted that whole article uh, was when he was watching, he's a tennis player, he's watching a tennis game on TV like Wimbledon, and the TV flipped from the players over to the audience and showed the coach of one of the tennis players. And he said, coach, coach, that guy's the world's best player. How, who else can teach him something? I'm not coaching as good as he is or he'd be out there playing, okay? But the guy has a coach, why is that? And once he thought about it, started talking to people, he realized because the fundamental thing, when we're performing tennis, surgeon, teacher, we see ourselves doing that which we're doing, in our case, teaching. But there are inherent limits in what we can see in ourselves. Conclusion, what we need if we want to improve our performance is some perspective on our work from another set of eyes. I think I have this here. That's Atul Gawande, and his article was in the New Yorker called uh, Our Personal Best. Uh, top athletes, things have coaches, should you? And he got one, and as a surgeon, what he found was his performance went up dramatically. Even though he was, he was top ranked, he was nationally ranked as a surgeon, it still got better once he started getting feedback slash a coach. We too need coaches, okay? See, we need to see ourselves through someone else's eyes. Whose eyes? Well, one eyes is our students. And I think there's some things about focused feedback that we can learn from. And again, I've got some resources on that website about that. Uh, by having students, we list our learning goals, say, did that happen for you or not? Why or why not? List the learning activities, did they work for you or not? List the assessment, same thing, okay? We can do that. But also we can get fellow teachers to share each other, you know, observe each other in the classroom and give feedback. Uh, but we can also have teaching specialists, somebody, these are the faculty developers around the world who's made it their business to understand teaching and learning, can talk to you, can observe you, and give you feedback on yourself and help you get some ideas to get better. We start getting all three of those feedback and we're gonna understand ourselves in a way that we never did before. Uh, okay. Can you get better? We can if we learn new ideas and use them and get powerful forms of feedback. Uh, okay, final thing. If you could turn to those, that, that top sheet and fill out the other two questions. What are the two or three biggest ideas you've gotten in the last hour here? And what action can you take in the next 48 hours to get better as a teacher? Okay, well, we need to wrap it up here. Uh, if you can do what you just wrote down here and, and capitalize on those ideas, learn some more about them and uh, start acting on them, you too can get better so that five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you can say like I said earlier in here, I know things about college teaching. I can do things as a college teacher now that I couldn't five, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And if you can say that, you're on a growth curve. And if you're on a growth curve, you are better, but your students are learning better. So thank you very much for that. Let's see that. No, it isn't the end. It's really the start of a new thing. So thank you and very good luck with everything. Thank you very much. <laughs>